Good afternoon, everyone. This is Kelly Smallridge, President and CEO of the Business Development Board. If I could ask that you all please mute your phones so we're not interrupted with any background noise, that would be wonderful. Thank you again for joining our seventh town hall meeting. Today's call has been sponsored by our friends at Florida Power and Light, who have supported our economic development efforts for well over three decades. I also would like to thank the three public leaders presenting today, Senator Marco Rubio, Mayor David Kerner, and Secretary Jonathan Satter, for the grits and the gut that you've shown during the single biggest challenge our state has ever faced in a very long time. We're making great progress and there are signs we're passing through the peak. To all the business leaders joining us today, we understand your impatience and we share your anxiety. Quite, quite frankly, without you, there really is no economy. We understand the long-term consequences of lockdown, but we can't lose control and risk a second spike of this virus, which would really set us up for economic disaster. In this process, difficult decisions have to be made by the three leaders here today. They've been making those decisions. But rest assured that the BDB, along with the Economic Council, Chambers of Commerce, Board of County Commissioners, and Administrator Virginia Baker will work very hard to lead Palm Beach County to recovery with a spirit of unity. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, Steve Pulitziner, President of ESPN West Palm. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks for everyone uh, being with us today. Uh, another great Friday BDB uh, Town Hall. Thanks to FPL as well our presenting sponsor. And uh, keep in mind, this is also airing live on ESPN 106.3 FM. So if you could please keep yourself muted um, so we can allow the information uh, from, our, from our guests uh, and from our um, panel that are joining us today to be dispensed, not only to everybody on the call, to the thousands uh, listening in uh, the community. So please keep your phones muted. Uh, and then, of course, if you have a question or there's a topic you would like to see address, addressed, please chat our BDB host by hovering over the bottom of your screen, clicking the chat box on your task bar, and we will try to get to uh, everyone's questions. Uh, we'd really like to welcome our first speaker to the call. We're really honored to have with us today United States Senator from Florida, Marco Rubio. He is the chairman of the Senate Committee on Small Business. A Republican, he previously served as Speaker of the Florida House of Representatives. Senator Rubio, welcome. I uh, want to give the floor to you to tell us about the Small Business Relief Program and how uh, things are working so far. Well, thanks for the opportunity to talk about this. I thought I'd just begin with something that I think applies across the board and uh, three, three points. One, some that have been made but that are bear people or reminding people of all the time. The first is that this is truly something without precedent. We've had economic downturns before and other challenges, but nothing in the lifetime of any of us on this call or listening to this show that compares, this compares to no other uh, for a lot of different reasons. It, it, and, and it'll last a lot longer for a lot of different reasons. Number two, it, it's one that has no easy answers. Every potential solution uh, comes at a price and at a cost and with some difficulty. So. There really are no easy uh, choices here, um, or in terms of in terms of not having any consequences or price to pay for them. Um, and I think the third is that there are no perfect answers either. I mean, um, any time you act in an emergency situation, by their very nature, it means that that's not going to be perfect. It, it's not perfect under no normal circumstances as is. So the goal always, when you're acting in an emergency, is to try to do as much good as possible and as least with the least amount of harm as possible. And that's certainly been the approach that, that we've tried to take with the view that in, in a crisis situation, uh, you, you, uh, the worst thing you could possibly do is not take action. And that vein is how we began working on trying to provide assistance to small businesses and small firms. At the time in which we took this up, there was always a lot of conversation about what would be done to the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department for larger businesses and the broader economy. But we realized that never had there really been anything in existence to help smaller firms that didn't really meet that criteria. And in the context of that, um, identified that we thought and felt that the most important thing we could possibly try to do is make it possible for businesses who might be operating on limited capacity uh, to retain as much of their workforce as possible, to keep workers attached to their employer for as long as possible. And we knew that would require funding. We had no easy mechanism in which to deliver it. 
Um, the emergency loan program is not designed for a national situation. They're designed for a, a tornado or wildfire or a, a hurricane or a flood, but it's not designed for something that impacts the whole country. We knew that. And so we chose to build upon sort of an existing framework, which is the 7A lending program and it's 1,800 delegated lenders, but we knew that that would not be enough and we had to act quickly. So the law was put together pretty quickly, a very bipartisan, every single word in that bill is something that everyone supported and signed off on, on our committee across the aisle and in the house, we had kept them in the loop on it as well. And then, um, you know, the treasury department and SBA had seven days to implement it and it launched on Friday, April 3rd. So it had six days to write up the rules. On Friday, April 3rd of this year, it was the first time ever that any lender had ever made a PPP loan, that any uh, borrower had ever applied for one, and that the SBA had ever processed it. So it was a brand new deal. And with it came all of the sort of hiccups that you would expect. That said, in its first round, it made over 1.6 million loans, an average loan amount of about $206,000. 74% of those loans were $150,000 or less. The loan amounts are built and based upon uh, the two and a half months of payroll. So at $150,000, you're talking about uh, $60,000 a month in payroll costs, uh, which is not a very big business. And, uh, but obviously the, the program uh, hit a cap in terms of the amount of money that was there for guarantees. So a second round of funding was provided. And in that second round of funding, uh, it provided another uh, $250 billion for lending guarantees. And then on top of the $250, an additional $60 billion of lending guarantees to be used exclusively by lenders with under $10 billion in assets. So primarily uh, local lenders, regional community banks, credit unions, and that sort of thing. Right now, we have, for, we went from, we've gone from 1,800 lenders participating to 5,200. I can tell you that in the second round, the average loan is going to be substantially less than in the first round. I think we're about roughly $75,000 loans. So remember the previous average is $206,000. That generally reflects that we're having smaller bank, uh, smaller businesses applying and, and independent contractors as well. Uh, the last point I would make on all, so we'll see how this works out, um, you know, in terms of that second round and reaching more people about, about 65, 66% of the lending so far has been made by those institutions with $10 billion and are under. They've been real superstars in all of this. A couple of last loose ends on it, on eligibility. You know, initially this was supposed to be about small business uh, as defined under the SBA code, which, which by the way is, is pretty broad. I mean, there are some of these companies that are being pilloried now actually qualify under the existing law. Um, they just never used SBA because they never needed it, but, but they qualify. It's not, there's a code that defines depending on the industry, what your employee numbers are and so forth. It depends how you qualify, a little complicated, but many of these already apply. And then a decision was made to expand it beyond just small business to include three things. The hospitality industry, because it was the hardest hit. Uh, at the time, I think over 60% of the unemployed in this country were coming out of hotels and restaurants. Um, expanded to cover 501c3s. Um, which obviously are, were facing difficult circumstances, yet providing services. And for the first time ever, independent contractors, 1099 workers, because they've become such a major part of our economy and of our jobs, and there was no, no place for them to plug in for assistance. So at some point, we're gonna have to do more, is my, my opinion. We'll see if my colleagues agree, but I don't, uh, I think we're still gonna end up, when all is said and done, we're gonna have millions of small businesses who have received assistance and upwards of 60 or 70 million jobs whose payroll will be covered under the funds for eight weeks or so of the funds that have been provided. But it won't get everybody. And, um, and my sense of it is that there's still uh, probably one more round to go before we start talking about recovery. So um, we'll see how that plays out. We're, we're returning to DC on Monday and, and we'll start working on that. And we've already been coming up with some ideas that some of the things we might be able to do. So uh, I close by saying that we, we are still in the disaster phase. I mean, we're still in the middle of the crisis. I would equate it to still being inside the home while the winds are blowing outside, the hurricane hasn't yet, yet passed. Um, but at some point we're gonna be able to emerge and take assessment of the damage that's been done and the ongoing damage and begin the recovery phase of it. And I think that that's gonna take a tremendous amount of work and creativity um, to, to sort of uh, deal with some of the damage that's been done because I think some of the damage will have to do with the closure stoppage of work but some of it frankly is going to be permanent changes in the way consumers and, and customers behave after this pandemic and uh, and there are real concerns about 
some industries consolidating in a way that could crowd out small businesses uh, in, in the future from participating. So uh, that's sort of the 50,000 foot view of this. And, and obviously I know you may have some questions you want me to answer, but I want, I want to thank you for this forum. And just to let you know, I mean, everyone's working as hard as they can to do the best they can under these circumstances. And that includes those in public office, in my opinion. So uh, thank you for the chance to talk to you about it. Thanks, Senator Rubio. Um, a lot of uh, great information shared there. If we can dig in uh, a little bit on, on just a couple of, of the things uh, that you said, it, in the event there is another round you know, of funding um, or stimulus support, uh, what have you learned from the, the first rounds of stimulus that, are, that will be key to include or to prioritize in another round? Well, I continue to push on the availability of, of lenders uh, in many ways. When people, when some, a couple of things that, first of all, it's important to provide information. So, um, in the, during the first round, people would say I was approved, but I haven't gotten the money yet. And, you know, lenders have 10 days to move the money. The money's not coming from Washington. It's coming out of the deposits held by the lender. Like a traditional loan, the lender forwards the cash. And then at some point, the lender can decide to keep the loan or sell it, in this case, to the Federal Reserve after a few weeks. But the money comes from them and they have up to 10 days to move it. So by now, everyone who was approved in the first round should have gotten their funding. Um, and, um, and so I think the, the, it's important to clear that up and, and, and make that clear to people. The other is um, on the application process. You know, in an ideal world, you would have been able to have lenders load these applications into the cloud somewhere and then just download it into the SBA system as, as opposed to what, what has happened. In the interim, while the money was out, you had a huge backlog of over a million applications built up. And so on the first day, it was, uh, you know, chaos as, as everybody was trying to push their application, applications out at the same time. You know, some of the larger lenders were using bots uh, to sort of do it. And, um, and the SBA had to stop it, not because of anything inherently evil about it, just because it was overwhelming the system. So, you know, I think in, in terms of, of moving forward, I mean, one of the lessons Move uh, is in the second phase is um, you know, trying to identify those sectors who could have qualified but didn't take advantage of it. Figure out why, what is the impediment there, and addressing it. And I go back to lender access. You know, we want to have as many lenders as possible be participating, because the more lending lenders there are, not just banks, not just credit unions, but now you've got Intuit and um, Square and PayPal and others platforms such as that. The more of those organizations are involved, the more access points you give people in terms of having access to it. Um, and, and one of the things we're still working on, which is in the law, is flexibility. There are businesses who laid people off who are going to have trouble bringing them back to work in the eight-week period. And so the law has in it a, a mitigation. It has the ability for an employer or business who takes this to be able to say, I wasn't able to hire them back in the eight weeks, but I've hired them back by June 30th. And we've asked Treasury and SBA to issue clear guidance on that piece because a lot of people are saying right now our biggest need is the operating cost on the front end. But uh, you know we're gonna we're, there isn't a, there is the the law creates a process by which uh, someone who takes this loan, a small business, can make that argument that yes, I wouldn't able to hire them all back in the eight week period, but I'm at that number now, and uh, and here's what I did in the interim and have forgiveness. And that hasn't been made clear. And that's one of the things that keeps coming up over and over. So that won't be clear until Treasury issues guidelines as to how that's going to work. And we've asked them to do that now for over a week. And I anticipate we'll get that here at some point over the next few days. Great. Uh, Senator, uh, this is a tough question because nobody, nobody uh, typically knows this answer. And you know this as well as anyone. Um, what do you think the president's next big move will be or, or should be? Uh, to uh, continue to address the situation? Well, really, I think at this point, one of the things that served us well, and I know there's a lot of dispute about that, it's become politicized, but our federal system of government um, that really gives a lot of authority at the state and local level has served us very well. I think it served us better than some of the countries that have centralized government because it has allowed local officials to adapt to circumstances as necessary. Even within Florida, you're seeing the distinction between 64 counties and the three counties here in South Florida um, and, and how the response has been with regards to it. So I think that the one thing the federal government can, can do is to sort of provide the resources and if necessary, the guidance uh, to do the things that states and local communities can't do for themselves. So as an example, you know, only the federal government can put enough money and demand behind the innovations we need in science and technology to develop effective therapeutics and ultimately a vaccine. 
only the federal government can put enough money and push behind the research necessary to develop a, a rapid testing capability that can give you quick results in real time and is widely available. Only the federal government uh, can create the mechanisms nationally to move the way the private sector has. Uh, th this uh, One of the great untold stories of all this that we'll look back at and say, wow, is what the private sector in this country was able to do in repurposing their capabilities to make ventilators. I mean, we're not there today, but we will have a ventilator surplus in this country at some point because multiple private sector entities sort of jumped on it and developed very quickly uh, these uh, ventilators that we were afraid we were gonna have a shortage of. That's an amazing story. You know, the ability to deputize the private sector to do that sort of thing. And, and I think our system prevents. So I think more of those things along those lines is really gonna be important. But the rapid testing is key because it allows you to do surveillance testing, which is like polling. Uh, it gives you a scientific sample of what's going on in an early preview that lets you get ahead of a new outbreak. And it also allows you to provide safe workspace. And the rapid testing will allow you to bring people back to workplaces and schools in a way that the fear of infecting other people is taken away. And, and, but that's gotta be widely available, uh, easy to use and accessible and, 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 and cost effective. So, uh, I think these are all important things that, that I hope the federal government will continue to focus on. And, and I do believe that the federal government's going to have to do something to help cities and, and counties uh, with their budgets as their revenues have declined dramatically because um, they will not be able to do their part in the system without them. Thanks, Senator Rubio. Just uh, one more question uh, with your time. I uh, appreciate everything you're doing uh, from a federal level uh, with uh, what you've been working on. But Florida is your home. Uh, South Florida, the area that has been hit the hardest. Um, when you think about our industries that we thrive on, hospitality, tourism, what do you think the coming out of this looks like um, for those that, uh, you know, that so rely, uh, South Florida that so relies on those industries to be thriving? Very difficult. Uh, um, and I want to be frank, I don't, there's no point in, in not being honest about it. It's going to be very difficult. I think the hospitality industry was the first one in and it's going to be the last one out. It's one of the reasons why we created, why we added them to the small business deal, because we knew that they would be the hardest ones to restart in one, some places because it's seasonal. And, uh, you know, it won't be uh, winter again until next year, which is where we really see the uptick in, in some of the visits down here. And, and the other is because of the unique nature of it. You know, somebody drives by a hotel and it says Hyatt or Hilton. It's not owned by Hyatt or Hilton. It's owned by some family or an individual business that happens to have flagged it and operated it that way. So the, the problem with hospitality is, in particular, hotels and lodging, is it's not just based on them. They may be allowed to reopen by local officials, but if people aren't traveling because of their own restrictions or if they're not able to use certain parts of what attracts them down here, for example, if you can't enjoy the beach and you can't go to nightclubs and bars, why would you, it takes away a lot of the reason to come down here. And, it's, and, it's, and the second part about it, that makes it very difficult is um, is the fact of the matter is that people use their uh, discretionary income to make these trips. And as so many people have been unemployed, uh, their economics have been harmed, and they're worried about a second wave shutdown putting them in the same position, I would imagine more people are going to be hoarding and holding on to whatever savings they can, trying to buffer themselves against future uncertainty. And that means maybe they don't take a trip this year, or, or maybe if they do, it's shorter. So I think it's gonna be very difficult for our region because we are so heavily dependent on service sector jobs that feed off of visits through hospitality, uh, both in, in the lodging and in the restaurant business. And, and it's gonna be something we're gonna to have to really focus on. Well, I appreciate your, your frank honesty uh, there. And again, for all, all the work that you're doing on all of our behalf and the country's behalf, Senator Rubio, and for a few minutes of your time today. Thank you. No. Thank you for including me. Stay safe, everyone. You as well. Um, we're going to pivot from Senator Rubio now to Mayor Dave Kerner, uh, representing Palm Beach County and the Board of County Commissioners. Prior to Mayor <laughs> Kerner, the Board of Commissioners, he served two terms in the Florida House of Representatives as the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee. Let's welcome the commissioner to give us the current county update. Um, uh, the floor is yours, Mayor Kerner, and uh, look forward to hearing your, your initial thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to members of the BDB for having me here today. Uh, Secretary Satter, it's an honor to have you here on the call with us. And I, I think uh, the Senator left us just a minute ago, but it was great to hear from Senator Rubio. Um, Palm Beach County has fared very well through the initial phase of the pandemic. I think we're all aware of um, some of the projections that were made early on. 
Um, and sometimes there's criticism about, well, there was a whole to do about nothing. Obviously, that's not true. First of all, there's not nothing left ahead of us. There's a lot of operational um, difficulties and operational concerns about suppressing the, the transmission of COVID-19. Um, and, and we're in this great position for a lot of reasons, one of which is that we, we did such a good job as a community of social distancing and taking this pandemic very seriously. We saw from <clears throat> the very beginning that Governor DeSantis um, took special caution and concern for the three counties uh, that consist of Miami, Dade, Broward, and, and Palm Beach, and with good reason, and, and that strategy has worked. We have um, a very robust economy down here, we did, um, but we also have, I'd say, six and a half, seven million people in that tri-county area. We have a lot of travel in and out. It's a very diverse demographic. There's a lot of travelers and visitors coming here. Um, there's a lot of folks that live here that are from other parts of the world, and their families come here often, so it's a, it's a very highly traveled portion of the state. And I think that dynamic um, becomes increasingly more obvious as you move from Palm Beach County south to Broward and then Miami-Dade. And so, you know, I commend the governor in a lot of ways for, for treating us uh, here in, in the three-county area differently um, than the rest of the state. And we've seen that continue through the emergence of the task force recommendations and now the governor in phase one uh, of the reopened Florida task force report that we continue to be more handled more cautiously. And I appreciate that the governor has given us that discretion to, to act a little bit more slowly. Now, having said that, um, and, and Commissioner Balachay has talked about this in the, in the Palm Beach Post, Palm Beach is not Broward and Broward is not Miami. We're all distinct in our own ways. And so we're going to have to have a little bit of a different response in terms of reopening the economy as we move forward. And, and while Broward may be a little bit slower than Palm Beach and Miami may, may be a little bit slower than Broward, I think that's the elasticity that the governor was trying to capture by allowing us some, some of that discretion here locally. So I'm very proud of the work that's been done by Palm Beach County. You know, I take a lot of pride in serving in an institution. Um, it's not necessarily the, the work of uh, myself or the Board of County Commissioners, but really the, the professionals, the fire rescue men and women, the deputy sheriffs, the professional staff of the county. It, it was an amazing response and I'm very proud of, um, of where we are at right now. And I'm, and I'm, you know, there's a lot of caution about what the economy is going to look like in a year from now. We're taking it day by day. Uh, I know that one question I get asked a lot right now is, you know, well, how slowly is Palm Beach County going to move? And that's not a, that's not a, a question that I get to answer alone. Um, as, as we emerge back into phase one, uh, the Board of County Commissioners will start to meet more regularly and we'll have a broader set of input from our elected officials. And we'll have the input from our local economy and business leaders as well. And, and of course, Governor DeSantis will remain uh, in dialogue with us and we will follow his lead. Great, Dave. Um, covered a lot there. Uh, let's draw, join, sort of drill in on a couple of specifics. Um, can you give us an update on how the testing sites, you know, are running and the potential for any new ones coming online? Yeah, so, you know, th that was one of the concerns that, that I had and I think that a lot of um, leaders had initially is, is as we pivot and do this transition towards reopening the economy that there's an assumption that this operational infrastructure that we have in place is no longer relevant or necessary. And as we've heard the governor say and the president say that this, this spot testing and surveillance testing, private testing, all of this is going to be a part of our lives for a long time. I know that um, law firm that I work for, or used to work for, it seems like, that, you know, they're going to start testing employees once they start coming back to work. And that's going to be a private measure. And, and that broad-based private testing needs to happen for that consumer confidence to emerge. But we also, from a governmental perspective, will remain highly engaged. Uh, the, the Governor DeSantis has talked about ensuring that our public testing sites that are up right now in Palm Beach County, and I, um, if, if anyone wants the phone numbers or, or needs the criteria to meet to get tested, please let me know and I announce it on, on the air here. But we have um, several testing sites supported by the National Guard uh, by the healthcare district, uh, and those will remain operational um, for the foreseeable future. And and I've had that promise made to me by by Tallahassee, and we're we're actually sourcing our own testing material. Uh, John Van Arnhem and I went up to, uh, he's our deputy county administrator, and, and Bill Johnson, the three of us, who's our emergency manager for the county, 
Uh, the three of us went up to Jupiter last week and toured Access Lab, and we started examining um, a way for us to purchase our own capacity at that lab um, way ahead of, you know, one thing is the, is the collection swabs. The other thing is the testing capacity of labs. And so, you know, being, for, being proactive, we went up to Access Labs and said, hey, can you, if, if we were to do this between the county and Access Labs, are, are you willing to save some capacity for us? And it's those types of things uh, that are going to have to occur in the future to ensure that the testing capability remains robust here in our county. Thank you for the uh, deeper um, explanation there. Um, let's talk, uh, Dave, go, go to another uh, area. How do you feel about a member of the Florida legislature filing lawsuits against local government for issuing stay-at-home orders and threats to exempt local government from emergency powers? It was a question that, uh, that came in and is, is, I think, certainly one that uh, people are wondering about. Um, I mean, have I been sued? Because I don't comment on litigation where I'm getting sued. The county gets sued all the time. Um, I say that jokingly. Let's be honest. I, I mean, the governor, you can tell the governor comes at this from an operational um, standpoint. His history um, bears that out and uh, his, his record of service bears that out. I come from it from a similar perspective as a police officer, a former police officer. We're here to get the job done. We're here to keep the health, safety, and welfare of, of the community first and foremost. If people want to sue us or if a member of the legislature wants to do some sort of stunt like that, I don't know that it's a stunt. I don't know much about it, but we have a job to do. And, um, you know, it is what it is. And um, thank you for addressing that. Um, as far as, uh, Dave, the recovery task force, um, can you give us a, a little bit more insights onto you know, what they're watching for or what they're focusing on as far as um, uh, next phase that might be upon us? So, it, first of all, it was it was sort of a surreal experience to be part of the executive committee of the task force, um, because usually I'm definitely not the smartest person in any any room that I go into. But in this instance, I mean, there were just the most renowned business leaders uh, in the state of Florida and maybe nationally, and we had some real awesome expertise from um, around the various industries that that Florida consists of from an economic standpoint. Um, what I can tell you is that there's been a, uh, nationally there's been sort of a politicized breakdown and well, if, if, if you go too strong on the recommendations or restrictions and it's, you know, a liberal perspective and if you don't open it up right away you know, or you should open it up right away, that's the, I don't know, Republican perspective. We haven't seen that, that dynamic emerge in Florida and, and that's from strong leadership and, and deep concern for the state of Florida and our residents. What the... What the task force put forward was, in my opinion, a very competent, very thoughtful, and very safety first um, piece of uh, publication that we put forward. The governor has started to adopt so, some of those recommendations, but you know, in his discretion, because he is our governor, he's he's curtailed some of the some of the recommendations, and then he's held you know held his power to dry on, on some of the ones going forward into phase two and three. And I can tell you just by serving in this process as one of the guys that was daily, uh, you know, operationally daily in Palm Beach County, um, the folks on the task force and the folks in Tallahassee and the leaders around the state, I can promise you have the best interest of our state in their hearts. And I think that's borne out by the very cautious and very effective recommendations that are contained within the um, Reopen for task force. Great. Um, Dave, are there, uh, are there any other communities, whether it's in other states, um, that you're paying attention closely to in terms of the way they're reopening businesses or really any models that you've seen? I know it's early, but any other models that you've seen um, that you're paying a, a, you know, close watch on because they could be applicable for our county? You know, it's funny you talk about that because I had a conversation with one of, you know, the kitchen cabinet members that I have, a dear friend of mine who's um, you know, very competent when it comes to economics. He's an economist and, and understands uh, statistics very well. And, and he was trying to find a, a, a country or a city in Europe that we can look at demographically and population-wise. I don't think that's going to be very effective. I think there's some cultural issues um, between the United States and Europe that, that, that don't allow for a person-by-person uh, -person comparison to be accurate. 
What I am excited to look at is how Palm Beach County is reacting to our first wave or phase one of our recreational um, plan, which started on Wednesday. And this will be our first weekend um, where our constituents can really go outside and start utilizing some of the recreational facilities to exclude beaches at this time. And so, you know, I have a sense that Palm Beach County individually has responded exceptionally well to the distancing requirements. And, and I don't have any doubts that, that will continue in the future. So I'm really looking to the conduct of our county citizenry uh, during this week and during the, um, the upcoming weekend. And I'm sure my colleagues on the Board of County Commissioners are doing the same. And quite frankly, I don't, I don't think we've had any concerns or problems. So, um, you know, my fears of a reoccurrence or reemergence of, of COVID-19 or spikes, as you will, um, are minimal as long as we remain vigilant. And kudos to Eric Call and County Parks and Rec uh, for the job they did and are doing, um, getting everything open and, and running smoothly. Um, as far as the business side, Dave, do you envision you now creating like a local task force specific to businesses reopening as there are those that have been created, those subcommittees in some of the other uh, larger uh, Florida cities? I do foresee that, and, and really the model that I would appreciate more is, which is what I did in the initial round, um, is sort of defer that, that committee making structure uh, and vetting to our county administrator. I don't, I don't want to politicize this, and I don't want to uh, get into a situation where the board has to meet every week to sort of vote on members of these committees. So um, I, I've asked Verdini, and I think a couple other commissioners have endorsed that concept, and Verdini Baker is out there now working with Michelle Jacobs and Kelly Smallridge and, and a lot of the folks in our community to start getting the, these uh, this input in and I can tell you that on a day-to-day -day basis um, I've, I've had the privilege and pleasure of talking with the governor and the governor's office to make sure that we we stay in lockstep and that you know they're aware of our strategy and we're aware of their orders and that we're working hand in hand so that um, we continue this, this really good synergy that's occurred between the three counties and the rest of the state uh, because God forbid one of the three counties starts to have a spike uh, of some meaningful measure. Um, that could have repercussions throughout the entire state. So we're very sensitive to, um, not that our counties are more important than any other county, but just the, the, the potential for um, ruining this good model that we have before us and how we've executed on it. It's important that we, that we work hand in hand with our local elected officials in the governor's office. Um, but I, I, I am excited, by the way, to see um, some of the input and some of the formation of these working groups because, you know, God knows, with the exception, uh, you know, Hal Valache is, is a strong, has a strong business background. My colleague, Commissioner um, Weiss, very strong business background. I've been a lawyer and a police officer, so, you know, I don't have all the ideas. I don't have all the concepts um, in my back pocket. And for us to open up Palm Beach County, on our own terms and in the most effective way, as the governor has allowed us that discretion, we're really gonna need the input from folks that are actually on this call, quite frankly. Mayor Dave Kerner with us, Palm Beach County Board of Commissioners, uh, the BDB Town Hall uh, live, as well as live on ESPN 106.3 FM. Uh, Dave, one more for you regarding uh, beaches. Uh, we know at the beginning, um, beaches a necessity because of the draw that it could have been from other areas with travel limited now uh, for others and we're coming out of season. Um, what will be the process for the assessment of what happens with beaches? That's probably the question that I get asked the second most after the economy and listen the, the, there is not a, a magic ball that any of us have in terms of evaluating metrics. A lot of this is how do you how well do you know your, your personal community and i remember that early on in the process uh, mayor jimenez from miami now he's a strong mayor and a strong uh, county mayor form of government so his powers are vastly different and broader than than mine as you know a regular county commissioner holding the title of mayor um but but he said very bluntly that you know his community is not ready to open the beaches and and that was three four weeks ago and i appreciated his candor in saying that and i can tell you that um here in palm beach county we, we have less population but i just think there are some inherent issues with the optics um and the enforcement enforceability of these rules at the beaches and so again i'm going to defer to 
A, the wisdom of, of our community and the wisdom of the Board of, County, Board of County Commissioners on when to open that up. It's no longer necessarily my decision, so to speak, or the uh, um, executive policy group, because that, that group made a lot of decisions during the pandemic. But now that we emerge back into some um, level of stability in terms of being able to meet as a Board of County Commissioners, I'd like, I'd like to see the board make those decisions. Um, and, and right now, I don't think our county is ready to embrace open beaches. I think we really need to show um, that we can, we can deal with the recreation effectively, that we're not going to have any spikes. Uh, and I'd like to see other portions of our economy open up first as well. I mean, that, that's for, for a later conversation. But specifically to beaches, I'm, I'm personally not in a rush to get there. And we'll see how the community reacts to that and my colleagues on the board. Great, Dave. And just Dave, last thing, a uh, final comment on uh, if there's something that our business leaders, you know, who are listening to several hundred and the several thousand uh, on radio as well in the community um, can take away or, or can do to help ensure that Palm Beach County is being safe and is, um, uh, can pave the road to recovery in the coming weeks and months, what would that message be? Well, the message that I would like to deliver to the business community is that this, this is a prime opportunity, as you, as the community always does and steps up to help us. Um, this is a great time to have your input um, to help craft the rules that are going to govern our county. So, um, th you know, that, that's an answer within an answer in that really at the end of the day, when we have this task force roadmap, um, but it's going to come down to the local business leaders and community to define what those regulations are. And then once those regulations are in place and we begin to open up a phased approach like the governor has instructed, um, th that, that the industries that they represent really hold their customers and their employees and their staff um, to that, to that uh, standard of care. And so I, I hope that we're all ready to engage in that. And I, um, I'm getting a text here, so I just want to make sure um, I'm not missing anything from you. Um, nope. nope. All right. Sorry. I saw that you were texting me. So I, I really like the leadership of the Palm Beach County business community to, to start um, engaging in this process. And they have already. And so I'm excited to see what the work product will be. Great. Thanks, Mayor Kerner, for your time. I, I know you're in a difficult spot having to uh, address some of these uh, answers that are uh, beyond your control. But we appreciate you know, really appreciate your leadership and your thoughts during this. Thank you very much for that. It's been an honor. Great. Um, we're now going to welcome in um, DMS Secretary Jonathan Satter. Uh, Jonathan was appointed the Secretary of the Florida Department of Management Services by Governor DeSantis in 2019. Secretary Satter was appointed to revamp the unemployment system. The governor said, uh, Jonathan, that your mission is simple <laughs> and that it is to get the unemployment assistance out as quickly as possible. Share with our our audience how things are going with this application process that uh, we, we know has been anything but you know, simple in, in addressing and unwinding. So um, <laughs> those were his words. I wasn't putting you in that spot, but go ahead. Uh, now's your uh, your opportunity to talk us through that. Yeah, thanks, Steve. And it's, it's great. I've been scrolling through and looking at all the names here. and I, I've got a lot of friends uh, there in Palm Beach County, and so I'm glad to have a chance to talk to everybody. Um, yes, uh, so I, I moved up from Palm Beach County in the beginning part of 2019 and have been running the Department of Management Services, which is the sort of the back office of state government. It is the, uh, the workforce and business operations. And about two weeks ago, the governor called me and uh, indicated that he needed to make a change here at the Department of Economic Opportunity uh, and, uh, and, and uh, assigned me to take over the reemployment assistance programs here at the, at the agency. So it's been about two weeks. We've made a lot of progress. Um, we've kind of put our strategy into four buckets. Uh, number one, we needed to communicate more uh, proactively. So we've been talking to the media quite a bit. Uh, we're uh, talking to our constituents. I talked to probably 20 legislators a day uh, and meet with some. I did a Facebook Live with, with a couple of state senators yesterday. Um, and most importantly, we need to be transparent with, transparent with our metrics. Um, I'm a big believer uh, in metrics. And uh, so the theme that I have uh, communicated to the staff here is um, 
one, uh, you can't manage what you can't measure. That's a, an old saying from a very famous economist. And so every day at floridajobs.org, we post our dashboard and our dashboard uh, tells us where we stand in terms of receiving claims, paying claims and processing claims. And so we want people to see what we're doing and hold us accountable. Secondly, we're, um, we're challenging the status quo. You know, sometimes when you work in government for a while, you can't see the forest through the trees. And so I think the, what the governor saw in me coming over here was I, I had no experience with it. So I asked a lot of questions. Um, I, I want to see proof on why we can or why we can't do things. And so we need to, we've been breaking through a lot of uh, red tape and cutting a lot of bureaucracy, which leads us into the third bucket, which Governor DeSantis has been very, very uh, integral. And that, that means that's regulatory reform. So we've cut a, a number of uh, red, we cut a lot of red tape, uh, uh, cutting through a lot of bureaucracy, both here at the state level with some of his executive orders. I've been on the phone with the, uh, the Department of Labor to try to get them to relax some standards while we work through the backlog. And then the fourth is the technology. We have, uh, we have a technology system that I've compared to folks in the past of being, a, you know, it's a 10 year old car. We bought the car, it was designed to drive 40 miles an hour. And now we're asking it to do the Daytona 500 uh, multiple times without any pit stops. And so we've had to make some significant technological improvements, uh, both on the hardware and on the application side while we continue to drive that car around the track. Well, thanks. Uh, got a little a deeper understanding about that. Um, well, do you foresee a day or a, a date you can share with us where a whole bunch that are in the queue will be, will be addressed or where the numbers, you know, you mentioned you're, you're big on numbers. Are there numbers that you can share about what, you know, specifically um, it looks like right now and what your goals or thresholds are in the coming weeks? Yeah, so um, we're, we are making significant process, we progress over the past couple of weeks. So in just round numbers, because I don't have the dashboard in front of me right this moment, we've received about 1.7 million claims. Uh, we're still working through that number. We think there are some duplicates. We had a much higher number yesterday, but we did a, a, a massive uh, uh, look at all those numbers and we had a bunch of duplicates. So we had an older system that was uh, that is still sort of the processing engine. Then we stood up a, a, a second system that is the user interface, which is up 24-7, 365. And then the agency offered to accept paper applications. So we think that there are a number of folks who may have made an application in the first system, didn't think they were successful. They applied in the, in, in the new system. And then just as a safeguard, they, they sent us some, uh, some paper applications. So of those, we think there's about 1.6 to 1.7. We have verified about 950,000 to a million of those. Um, the number between the verified and the million seven is where somebody might have started an application and all they did is put in their first name and then they abandoned it. We have received paper applications, I've seen them, where all they put was their name on it and then they mailed it in. Without any more information, we can't process those. So of the 950,000, we're making tremendous progress. I think uh, we have uh, ruled on about 75 to 80% of those. Uh, there are a number of, of instances where someone may be ineligible, uh, but we've, we're increasing that percentage every day. Uh, so we're making a lot of progress. I, I think to answer your question is, we need to know when applications will stop coming in. We hope that with the governor's plan to um, to reopen the state in various stages, that we'll start to see those applications uh, slow down. Um, great. And as far as from the 1.6, 1.7, uh, do you have an estimate on what have those been filed from Palm Beach County? Uh, I don't off the top of my head. Okay. Um, and then as far as the process, um, is there a goal, like a stated goal of once someone files, and I guess files is still a bit gray of when, when officially is that happen, to when will, they, when will they actually receive funds or when will their funds uh, be available? Yes. So um, the standard process from application date to the date that a payment would be sent to the claimant is about 21 days. And that is commensurate with Department of Labor standards. Where we have challenges is when a claimant files an incomplete application. 
So I'll give you an example of the most common challenge that we have. <clears throat> Someone is laid off from their job at uh, a fast food restaurant. And uh, to use the example of, uh, that Senator Rubio used, you might have 20 McDonald's in Palm Beach County. Many of those McDonald's are owned by different franchisees. So all they write on their application is, I work at McDonald's in West Palm Beach. Well, then, we, then it requires manual research to determine where that employee worked so that we can assign them to their right employer. That slows the process down tremendously. Thanks. And then also, as far as the um, requirement to job search being reinstated, um, how will that affect applicants relative to benefits continuing uh, to, to come in? So currently that requirement is effective through tomorrow, May 2nd. We anticipate uh, issuing some additional guidance, which will extend that a short period, um, but I'm not ready to necessarily let the cat out of the bag on that one. Okay, um, and I think, um, I think, John, and you really addressed so, you know, so many things. I, I guess the last thing is um, trying to fix the technology on the fly is, <laughs> is challenging. Is there a general message of, um, and I'm not putting words in your mouth, but um, it's only going to get to a certain extent because, like you said, not set up to deal with this, this, um, you know, this amount of claims and that ultimately it's going to get better but it, it may not be what everyone's wishing um, in the next couple of months. Yeah, so I think the, the, the challenge for us, uh, quite frankly, when I got here two weeks ago, is just working through the backlog. And I think we, while there's a number of people who have not been addressed because we may have incomplete information from them or we haven't received the information from their employer, we're making progress on, the, on that every day. So we are uh, putting a dent in it, and, and we're going to slowly work through to, to uh, down to that last person. Um, the technology, as you indicate, was not designed for this. 20, December 2019 claims were about 23 to 24,000. Uh, there have been days since I've been here in the last week where we've received 80,000 claims in one day. So needless to say, the system wasn't designed for this. I, quite frankly, I'm not sure that the system, anybody could have anticipated the situation that we have found ourselves in over the past six to eight weeks. Um, I'm not sure what the, what, the, what the answer is going forward. I've just, as you started off the, uh, the session, my prim primary mission charged by Governor DeSantis has been to get payments out quickly. A lot of people ask me questions about, you know, whose fault was the system, uh, that the system was um, not designed properly, et cetera. I haven't focused on those negatives. All I've been focused on is getting those payments out as quickly as we can. Great, and uh, appreciate you jumping in and getting involved and the work you're doing here, as well as what you just shared with us, which gave a much deeper understanding you know, of what's going on. So Jonathan, uh, can't, can't thank you enough for joining us today. Thanks, Steve, enjoyed it. Well, we'd like to thank Florida Power and Light for sponsoring today's town hall call. We are neighbors and we are in this together from Florida Power and Light. Um, thank you everyone for taking the time to prepare for this call. Um, our panel, uh, fantastic as always, and tremendous job by the BDB. Um, the very sought after guests continue to come on here and, and provide input. And each week we're hearing from community statewide and, and even beyond uh, leaders. So uh, we hope you find this valuable. Uh, when we thank you for the time, the several hundred that were on the line, the several thousand on ESPN 106.3. And you heard the message there from Mayor Kerner was, you know, we encourage, you know, your feedback. So tap into the business community uh, resources at bizhelppbc.com, where they will be updating information around recovery efforts. And then, of course, next Friday, we'll have more information at this same time where we welcome you to continue to listen and continue to participate as several of the questions that were asked today came from those of you that were on the call. Uh, we hope you have a great day. Um, please stay healthy, please stay safe, and we'll talk to you next week.